one of the things that this also helps um, in, in the family is, and I know the Lord confronted me on this because I was such a, uh, not that I'm not now, but I was such a compromised person. And one of the things that I've noted with children, and I certainly am chief among this, and so it's with shame they even talk about these things, but it's, it's to let you know, to say something to you. In, in all the years that we've served in ministry, a lot of times, a lot of times, we uh, have counseled young people and uh, the ministry involved in right now for the last uh, 22 years has always been young people. And, uh, and adults are there too. But one of the things that children uh, will tell you, one of the things that, that, that when you're dealing with some child, a teenager or whatever, that's very angry, and you'll go, why? What is it? And uh, it's not every time, but it is way too often that the, especially the father, the father and the mother can do it too, but, but one of the parents or both are behind the children pushing, saying, you need to act like this, and you need to get... Uh, I literally have had done men's conference, and men go home, and I, I've had them, they wound up confessing it to me later on. They went home, told their wife and kids, here's what I learned, you need to be meditating on God's word, and told them to go meditate on it and didn't do it themselves. Uh, World War II, there was a fine Christian man. Uh, his name uh, was Major Winters, and he's famous because he was the uh, lieutenant, captain, and eventually major in uh, Band of Brothers book and, and uh, eventually a, a, a movie about, I don't know much about it, but he, uh, I, read, I read a book about Captain eventually Major Winters, and he was a, a godly man, loved the Lord. And he made the statement, don't come to me and let's have a conference about leadership. There's no reason for that. Leadership is two words, follow me. Leadership is two words, follow me. His men, uh, many years after World War II, said they would follow him anywhere, it didn't matter what it was. To that day, these were old men, one of them lacking a leg. And he said, I'd follow him anywhere. Anywhere he need, wanted me to go right now, to this day I would. Because he understood something, follow me. You don't sit behind your wife and child and push. Wives, you don't sit behind the uh, husband and wife or kids and push. And the, where the Lord confronted me on it, and it's, it's uh, and I, I give this to you, to just say, the Lord spoke to me one day as I was meditating on Scripture and uh, Matthew uh, chapter 7, I believe, uh, where the Lord is saying, if your son asks you for a loaf of bread, you wouldn't give him a stone. If he asks you for a fish, well, you wouldn't give that to him, would you? And... I was meditating on that, and the Lord spoke up and said, okay, what if your son asked you for the stone? Instead of bread, would you give that to him? Oh, no, Lord, I wouldn't do that. I would uh, give him the bread. And I say, son, you know, I'm, I'm merely talking in terms of what the Scripture said, a child. child comes and asks for, for a stone. Oh, no, no, I, I would give him bread. What if he asked for a snake? Oh, no, no. A snake is, you know, is a symbol of sin. Oh, no, I wouldn't do that. Uh, I would give him the fish to eat. And God spoke very strongly to me. And he said, you're wrong. Because the fact is, is that you have done that. You, leading from behind uh, and being compromised with the world and not receiving God's word for so many years, uh, your child, you gave them, oh, wait, you, you need God's words. Here's, here's the bread. 
of life, but at the same time during a week, you're offering the stone cold deadness of the world, the world's entertainment, the world's music, uh, the church's world's music, and offering the fish, Christianity. Isn't it interesting that Jesus would choose the fish and the snake? Fish, the eventual symbol of Christianity, and snake, the symbol of sin and Satan together. And I again tell you, uh, the problem here is that we're double-minded. And, you know, even, and I'm going to get into this real quickly, even the main doctrine of church, which is not biblical, I, I tell you again, it's not biblical. You cannot find anywhere in Scripture that it's going to say what I'm about to say. There's not any verse that says, when you die and you're a Christian, you go to heaven. There's not a verse that says that. And yet that is the major doctrine. And the major, we, but guess what? Why? Why do we want to go to heaven? Uh, oh, because I love God? No. Why do I not want to go to hell? You could not want to go to hell, but it has nothing to do with loving God. It has everything to do with loving you. What's going to heaven? Everything with loving me. And uh, our Lord is not asking for people like that. He wants a people of his own possession, zealous for good works, uh, that walk in his ways and know him, that receive his word, rather than the double-minded person that I sit before you and represent very loudly. And we would be counseling with children off the time, often, older children. Uh, there's in the teens and 20s. And they would be so frustrated, so angry. And the reason for it is that, that scripture, the scripture says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger or wrath. And what's going on is that these children are angry because the father says one thing, but then does another. Now, anyone would get frustrated if, if uh, let's say you're at work and your boss says, uh, now I want you to get this work done. And as soon as you start working on that, he says, oh, and by the way, I'm adding this, 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 and this, and all of those things make it impossible for you to do the job that he just told you to do. And you would get very frustrated immediately. Well, guess what we've done with our kids? Um, we... Uh, tell them they need to be godly and seek the Lord, but we don't do it. Uh, we tell them they need to be receiving God's word, but I don't lead from the front. I don't do it. I tell them to do it. We send them to Awana. Uh, we send us to whatever we want to go to, a movie or, or whatever. Uh, finally, the kids are not here. Uh, they're off at church somewhere. Folks, this is not correct. This is not the way it's supposed to be. And I am the last person in the world needs to be telling you how to act as a parent. What I'm doing is telling you from Scripture how to act as a Christian. Now, what we've been talking about here in this last, last part of this talk has been, in many ways, authority uh, over, uh, and authority in the family, leadership in the family, and uh, the, the, the uh, focus that we should have on receiving God's Word and into our lives, especially as parents and leaders. And if you're a child, older child, you need to be doing the same thing uh, so that you can uh, pray and, and uh, influence your family. But we, we look in the book of Acts, and it's, it's interesting. This is after the uh, Jesus' resurrection. Uh, it is after the indwelling and the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the church is, God is multiplying it. And then we look and we see the 12 apostles and they're waiting on tables. I mean, this is the, the, the apostles, the, the men that walked with our Lord, uh, waiting on tables. <clears throat> but they weren't even getting tipped. And this is silly. Well, eventually they woke up to it and they said, it's not good for us, this is in chapter 6 of Acts, it's not good for us to be waiting on tables. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. We are neglecting the Word because of this. We need to be giving our lives to the Word of God in prayer. Now, 
it's really interesting what you see right there. The apostles, the head, the leader, the leaders, quit doing things that are busy things, and they start doing things that are godly things. They begin to seek the Lord. They begin to seek him through prayer and through the word. But what's interesting is it, it's at that point in the book of Acts that you begin to hear almost nothing out of the apostles. Oh, a little bit here and there, but it's not much. Because what happens is the head begins to do what the head is supposed to do. Receiving God's word and praying about God's word, about those underneath. What happened to the ecclesia underneath? It exploded. Uh, you don't see in scripture one of the apostles being picked up and transferred uh, through time and space, uh, but you do see it happen with Philip. Uh, you see these amazing miracles and, and the church just exploding. You see uh, Paul coming to uh, salvation and his uh, amazing input uh, into the church and why has this do we not do this? I mean, one is that we've kind of made uh, success, said that it's about learning and rather than uh, a relationship with God and allowing him to do it. And the thing is, is that Satan knows something that we don't believe. Jesus said that if a thief wants to come and break into a house, the first thing he has to do is bind the strong men. He needs to bind the strong men. And when he binds the strong men, he's able to do whatever. Now, when you think about it, um, where we are, uh, and especially uh, those that are leaders or parents, we're the strong men in the house. And yet we've been bound. And if, if you were to picture right now, uh, the strong man, it's you. With the armor of God, you've got the helmet of salvation, breastplate of, right, of righteousness, truth, you know, all these things. And, <clears throat> but you're sitting in a chair and you're, you're bound up. And what parts of the armor will work? Well, you think about it, the breastplate is still going to work. The helmet, the shield may be a little bit... Uh, won't be able to move very much, but it's still there. It will still shield things. But the one that won't work is where Satan always attacks. If I can just get them away from God's word. Get them reading and doing anything else except God's word. Because when you're bound up, the sword of the spirit, the one thing that we're given as uh, with prayer as the ag aggressive uh offensive weapons but we're bound and Satan has lied to us and told us I mean you can hear it I've heard it when I would be talking some pastor would uh, come up well don't you uh, think that these memorizing scripture is rather passe and no I don't uh, and I, I even had a was going to do a conference men's conference and was talking to one of the elders of the church. I was a deacon in this church, and uh, this was a high point for the men in the church, and I was going to be the main speaker talking about abiding in God's word. And uh, I don't want to be tacky, but there was not one elder that came to that meeting. There were 130 men, 130 men that came to that meeting, but not one elder of that church came. And... Uh, this is amazing because when I, I talked to one of the elders uh, about it, he said, oh, you're talking about meditation? And I'm trying to quote what he said. Been there, done that, but that's not where I'm at right now. Now, I've had men that would say when I got through teaching these things, man, you don't let off. You just keep coming and coming and coming about this stuff. And, 
you know, do, when do we get a day off? Literally, I've had them almost say that. And I would look at them and go, well, you tell me when Satan's going to give you a day off. Because uh, it doesn't stop. The lies continue. And they bind us up. We're bound by the things of the world. We're bound by untruth. We're bound by our wrong belief system. It is the truth that makes us free. Jesus was saying to the disciples, those Jews who had already believed on him, if you abide, continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples and... Abiding in the word, you're truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. We have gotten away from God's word. Uh, God's word has gotten away from us, and we fight about the silliest things, and scripture tells us, Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, everybody hears that, but nobody ever quotes the second half but happy is he who keeps the law. Where there is no vision, the people perish. What does he contrast that with? But happy is he who shamars, that's the Hebrew word, who keeps the law. We've lost this in scripture, we are rather in the church, because Satan knows the one place I have to go, the one place that I'm gonna stop the family, the one place I'm gonna stop the church is to get them away from God's word. Romans 8, 6 says to be carnally minded, to be worldly minded, to be minded of, of doing things in my flesh is death. But to be spiritually minded, and Paul defines this in chapter, in chapter 8 of Romans, is life and peace. He defines it, he, def, he specifically says that those that are carnally minded uh, are going to continue that way because they are not able to submit their mind to the law of God. Now, I don't know what anybody does with that, but I look at that and I look at it with shame. I was 40 years old when I began to keep God's word. And I'm, that was about 60 years too late. Uh, have I been doing it now? Yes. Do I need to continue? Violently, I do. This is, even, even we, I say violently, the, uh, spiritual warfare. Uh, spiritual warfare, according to uh, Corinthians chapter 10, says, tells us that uh, it's taking every thought captive. Now, it, 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 your Bible's going to say to the obedience of Christ, but that word obedience in the Greek, I dare you go look it up, is not to obey. Now, I understand the end result is obedience, so I'm not arguing with that. But it says that to keep it to obedience, the obedience, actually the Greek word means listening up under. In other words, you take every thought captive is what the deal is. What is spiritual warfare? Taking your thoughts captive to listening to Christ instead of listening to this earth. This is why we struggle and uh, with, with these things. Uh, now, there are practical points on meditation and memorization that I'm going to go on and talk about here. Um, first, pray for the promise. This is first and foremost. Pray for the promise of the Holy Spirit's help. Remember, we talked about this earlier. Yeshua said that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things, meditation, and bring to your remembrance all that I've said. That's memorizing. The Holy Spirit will help you. Uh, I promise you. And this is one of the things we're supposed to be doing. The helper is going to be there to help us to memorize, to meditate, to keep God's commandments. Um, now, sometimes people want, well, if I get somebody that I can be accountable, accountable to, you know, I found that accountability just doesn't work really well. Um, it, one of the reasons is you've got two people and you know eventually it's going to go down. It, it needs to be, I think, more than two because it's a, a three-stranded uh, cord that is not easily broken. The reason is because if I've had a bad week and I know I'm supposed to call this guy and let's get together, he's had a good week. He's memorized, I don't know, the entire book of First John this week. I've memorized Our Father Who Art in Heaven. And... Uh, I don't want to call this guy and I don't want to find out how he's going to do so much better than me. 
So accountability, and, and neither one has authority, and they may be tough on you, but it's not a bad thing. But if you're going to do it, at least do it with three people so that this person asks this person asks this person, and it's not a back and forth thing. But it's still, uh, I'm telling you, the one that needs to keep you accountable is the Lord God. I'm going to be just, I just tell you the truth. It needs to be the Lord um, because it's the reproofs of life that remind you, oh my. I'm not where I need to be. My children are struggling. My wife is struggling. Well, what are you doing? Uh, Are you receiving God's word? As a woman, you may be, my husband is, well, win him without a word. By you receiving God's word and him getting the benefit of that, you begin to pray. And uh, I would say uh, to one of the things on, on meditation is, to, uh, and I'm going to turn to Proverbs chapter 3. I have men, of course, this is one of the things I speak on a lot of times, and uh, guys will come up to me that have memorized, and uh, they will come up and go, well, what do you do when you've memorized these things, but then you forget it? I'll memorize this, and I'll start doing something else. Well, then I forget what I've memorized. Well, the Bible actually has the answer for that. In, in Proverbs chapter Three, which is a great thing about God's uh, ways and word. But he starts out with the following. My son, do not forget my teaching. Ah, well, there's the problem is we keep forgetting. Do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. In other words, folks, memorization is important, but you hide the word in your heart. It's the meditation that's the most important. I will have guys come run up to me. What are you memorizing now? Uh, all excited, but it, when they're doing it, I'm going, you don't get it. It's, it should be, what are you meditating on? What are you hiding in your heart? Uh, you will find that as you hide these things in your heart, that the Lord will bring it to your remembrance. The Lord will change the way that you give out wisdom or things that you say because it's it's hidden in there. By the way, don't be afraid to go back and rememorize something. Uh, in fact, rememorizing is a whole lot easier than memorizing. And I used to joke and tell people, in fact, I, I recommend that you re- rememorize before you memorize because it's easier. I think two or three people got my bad joke, but um, rememorize it. It's okay. It's, it's, I will do that with a lot of scriptures, and, and it's often like going back to an old friend that I've left for a while, but I hadn't seen and to, to go back into the book of James or John 14, 15, 16, to, to receive that back, to be rememorizing it, be thinking on it. Uh, the, the Ten Commandments, Exodus 21 through 17, the, go back and look at it. God always has something more he wants to say. It goes deeper, deeper down into your heart. Don't do it in your brain. I understand that's part of it. And your, your mind, but you're taking it down into your heart through meditation. Thy word have I hid in my heart. The new covenant says that uh, in the new covenant, what he will do is write his law upon our hearts and our inward boats parts. And this is terribly important. Now, uh, there's another thing that I find that's very important, and that's repetition. And it's so important, I need to repeat it. It's repetition, repetition, repetition. Out loud, out loud, out loud. Faith, com- faith comes from what? Hearing. When I'm speaking it, muttering it to myself out loud, you're driving somewhere, you're in a room by yourself. Uh, My wife and I used to go, what were you saying? No, no, I'm I'm talking to God. Oh, okay. Uh, And we, because the other person's over there, muttering quietly to the Lord and themselves, God's word. And it's important. Uh, To me, memorizing is very difficult. But... The, the way that I do it is just straight head on. Uh, first, relying upon the Lord, but it's through repetition, repetition, repetition. Uh, a, a musician, you listen to them play something and you're, just, you're amazed, but it started out with some very slow movements that they did over and over again and got faster and faster and faster to where they could play that way. And it's important to do it out loud because your tongue and your mouth are now speaking 
the truth of God's word, and it helps you with your faith also. Now, where do we start? Where would you, I would strongly suggest you start in Exodus chapter 21 through 17. That's the Ten Commandments. It's short, it's only 17 verses, but that is God's plow, that's his heart, that's the place to start. Memorize it, begin to meditate upon it, pray it for yourself, pray it for your wife, your husband, your kids, whatever. Um, from there, honestly, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is so full of just amazing things from God's wisdom. 1 Corinthians 13, the, the book of James, uh, Romans 6 through 8. The way that I memorized is I have three by five cards in my, po my pocket, and I would just write the the verses out, maybe a couple of verses per card in large print so that I could see it. And I would, when I finished with that one, I would put it out facing out in the back as I'm starting on this one. I need it there because that's the one I'm going to forget the most. It's readily. Now, today, people have their phones and I don't use the cards as much as I used to. Uh, I'll use my phone and I've just got it on the notes and two touches of the thumb and I'm there. And uh, you can have that with you all the time. You've got your phone there and you can be looking and meditating on Scripture, memorizing Scripture. It's important that you saturate yourself with it. Now, there's a, another thing that you can expect and that is persecution. Satan is going to come at you from the places you, you wouldn't expect, from family members that you love, uh, friends, church members, uh, they they will come at you with, uh, and not even know what they're saying. I, I literally, I had one time a person walk up and was saying things that somebody had told them weren't, weren't true, but they were saying these things and screaming and yelling, all mad at me. You know, so I'm sitting there looking at them, and I literally am going, I don't even know your name, and uh, they, but they had heard something, and we're, we're gonna get it out. Another thing that, that I think will happen, and it certainly happened with me and happened, I know, with a number of other people. But after I begin to memorize and meditate on the Scripture, I, of course, at night, I'd go to bed and I'd be thinking about the Word. And uh, one night, I had a really vile dream. It was, it was awful. That's all I remember of it. It was just terrible. It was everything that you could possibly think of to just make you be sick, as a Christian anyway. And I had that dream, and I, but I woke up and I went, oh, that's terrible. And you know, when you have dreams like that, often you'll feel awful afterwards and depressed and just yucky. And, and I, I woke up and, oh, that was, that was terrible. I, 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 why don't I feel bad? And I literally, I mean, I'm talking a, just a half a second after I woke up, I could not remember anything about that dream. I thought, wow, that was strange. And well, a night or two later, it happened again. And I woke up and it was, and it was gone. And I knew something was going on. I said, Lord, what in the world is happening? He said, son, my word is not going to live in your heart with that filth. That's what you had in there. And it's like water coming up underneath oil. And it's lifting it up, it's pushing it out. And he said, even a doctor doing surgery on you will put you to sleep. I came to you while you were asleep and uh, I lifted, began to lift these things out of there with the washing of the water with the word.